Seleção de Portuguesa. The national team of Portugal are looking to be first-time winners of the World Cup this year. With a team with so much talent, with the likes of Cancelo, Nuno Mendes, Bernardo Silva, Rafael Leal, Cristiano Ronaldo, Bruno Fernandes, I can go on and on. But they're managed by a manager who is outdated and his tactics just don't represent the quality of this team. And in today's video, we are previewing Portugal squad, Portugal's best 11, Santos's tactics, and what to do with Ronaldo when it comes to this team. But I need a guest, and today's guest is a special one, and you will see it in the video. So remember, people, let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below of Portugal's chances at this year's World Cup. What should be the starting 11 for Santos's team? Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button. Let's get to the video. So, Adrian, Portugal, they never make it easy. Qualifying for World Cup or Euros. And yet again, they have to go through the playoffs after losing to Serbia at home. What's your kind of overall feel with this team and heading into this World Cup? Because we know Portugal have one of the most talented teams in the world. There's no doubt about that, but it just seems like there's a bit of unease with this team. Maybe that's because of the manager, maybe because of the star player, but what is the overall feel you think with the Portuguese side at the moment? I think that you can tell or pin it all, I should say, on the manager at the moment, because first of all, it's the tactics that nobody really enjoys watching anymore. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, that, that constant meme coming up of how many pivots will Santos play? No matter the opposition, whether it's a team that Portugal should be steamrolling or what have you, is it going to be one, two? Will it go for a quadruple pivot? And that's never been seen before. So that's sort of the ongoing thing when it comes to Santos is that his style of play doesn't match up with the crop of talent that Portugal has now. At Euro 2016, it made sense. Sure, there was talent in that Portuguese side, but it was nowhere close to what we're seeing now. So playing that sort of negative football was still frustrating back then. But you could at least understand it a little bit more in comparison when you're comparing, sorry, Portugal versus some of the opponents they're coming up against. But now when you look at Portugal, like you said, the attacking talent, even in the midfield, I'd say the midfield and the attack, there's a wealth of options for Fernando Santos. In defense, we can get to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. There could potentially be some issues in center back. We don't know yet. Um, but in the attack especially, and when you look at Cristiano Ronaldo, who you brought up sort of by saying the star player, there's this insistence on constantly playing him. And Fernando Santos, even as recently as I believe it was September during the Nations League window there, was saying that, you know, whatever is happening with Ronaldo at the club level, he's, he's going to start for me. You know, he's still the guy for Portugal, which is a bit frustrating to hear, Michael, because it's... I like a meritocracy in any sort of team. I like a player who has been playing well to be given the chance. Um, and... The opposite should be the true as well. When a player isn't playing particularly well or they're not in good form or what have you, maybe they should take a seat on the bench for just a little bit, you know? Let someone else who's in better form have an opportunity. And it doesn't look like that's going to be the case with Portugal. So the two main things, I mean, ultimately it comes down to Santos, right? Because he's the man who's making that decision to put Ronaldo out there no matter the form he's in. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the tactics. And then the sort of Ronaldo question, which is obviously dominating the minds of a lot of Portuguese supporters. And of course, like during the qualifying process, you know, there was the craziness of the Serbia game where Ronaldo mm -hmm. scored, but obviously goal line technology wasn't involved. Then losing at home in just drastic fashion when Mitrovic scored the last minute goal. Then you go again to the playoffs like you always do. It just seems Portugal and the playoffs are just peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. And... I think, though, against Turkey and North Macedonia, you kind of saw a little bit evolvement from Santos, a bit more attacking football. But then the Nations League, it goes back to being defensive football, especially against Spain. So, like, what, what are we going to see with this football team? That's the biggest question mark I have with Portugal. I, I, and I have no idea um, because <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of... No, after that Serbia match where Portugal just needed a draw at yeah. home, he said, because it was another big failure, you know, if we don't make it through the playoffs then obviously I'm going to resign and Portugal can go in a different direction with a new manager, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Of course, they did end up qualifying partially, I think. I, I don't know how it would have gone if Portugal ended up facing Italy in that oh. playoff final. Would have been a different story, not the greatest record against them. Um, but now it seems like we're going to get more Fernando Santos ball at major tournaments because that's what we always see. And Michael, I always like to bring up this stat with Fernando Santos at major tournaments. He has won just three matches out of 15, I believe, within 90 minutes of play that's that's insane and that's including euro 2016 which portugal won the entire tournament 
So three matches that Portugal has won within 90 minutes. Euro 2016, World Cup 2018, and Euro 2020. That's not good enough. That that's really, a, really that, isn't good that's enough. That's a great point. He only won one game in the 90 minutes in the Euro 2016, and that was Wales. Yeah. Yeah, oh and he's he's had to rely on, you know, third place, sort of that rule coming into effect with Euros. Yeah. So his, his record of major tournaments is not good, but he always has that feather in his cap of, well, I've won a major tournament with Portugal. So it's this sort of strange, like... It is a, con it is a conundrum, that is for sure. Yeah, for sure. And so... I would like to think that he's just going to go, you know, let's go all out. Let's attack. Let's use all of our tools that we have at our disposal in this World Cup. But just from what we've seen of him in the past, it directly collides with that. Exactly. So I would expect more of the same from him. I would expect, you know, sitting back a little bit too much, trying to hit teams in transition um, and not really trying to play on the front foot and generate as many chances as possible. And it's going to be Ronaldo ball. It's going to be that magnetic pull towards Ronaldo yeah. um, as per usual. That's pretty usual, exactly. So let's talk about squad selection. Not, we're mm -hmm. not going to go through the whole 26 because that will be taking way too much time for both of us. Let's talk about maybe some surprises you think could happen with the squad selection. So w maybe a few names you could throw out there. Maybe we can discuss about them if they may, because we know like the usual names, Jao Cancelo, Rui Patricio, Ronaldo, Bernardo Silva. These guys are going to be in the squad. But what about some few surprises? Um, I would I would say that just with how Benfica, I know people are going to say, hey, bias, but just with how Benfica are playing in this moment, naturally a lot of their players are really, really, really in form at this moment. So maybe someone like a Florentino who has been dominant in central midfield for Benfica, he's been cleaning up both domestically and in the Champions League. He had more interceptions than any other player in all of the Champions League group stage with like 19 or something. I think he outscored the next guy by two or three. Um, so that's someone that I could look to as potentially he could be sort of a last three, four month surprise based on how he's played because his career got a little bit weird for a while with Benfica after Bruno Lage left and then he went to Hitafe and it just wasn't really hitting for him. But now that he's back at Benfica under Schmidt playing incredibly well, of course, Antonio Silva is going to be a conundrum as well because he's playing incredibly well for Benfica as well. Like I said, these Benfica players are causing issues based on their form. Mm -hmm. Um, it, but it's got to be a question of, is he is he someone that you just bring along for the sake of it? Because I can't really see him starting matches. Uh, it's not something that Santos would do. He typically has his guys, and he'll stick with his guys, which is understandable. You know, you you only get to play with these players or see them play a couple of times per year or a few times per year. So it's natural that you want the ones that are already know each other well. Um, so I don't know that Antonio Silva will get in there. And then, of course, there's Beto at Udinese, um, oh, yes. who is playing quite well. Um, Udinese has fallen off a little bit, maybe sort of settled back down to their place a little bit in Serie A, but uh, Beto is certainly someone that a lot of people have been calling for. There's also Vitinha from Braga, who's been playing quite well. Uh, Vitinha, the forward, the striker, I should say, not to be confused with Vitinha at PSG. Um, Ricardo Horta as well for Braga. Yes. Yep. There's, a, there's a couple of guys at Braga that are doing pretty well that could cause some uh, more headaches for Fernando Santos. So as far as surprises go, I would say that those are probably the main ones basically yeah and obviously there's there's a couple injuries when you think of jota mm -hmm. possibly pepe i think he still hasn't been back fit yet and he hasn't played for porto in a yeah. while so that could be a big issue then for fernando santos because we know he loves pepe yeah that's that's his guy so now let's get to <laughs> fossil tactics uh -huh. let's let's get to dinosaur barney barney style <laughs> what what is fernando santos ball is it a 4-2-3-1? Is it a 4-3-3? What do you kind of see with Fernando Santos heading into this World Cup? Because we know it's going to be a double pivot. We know it's going to be Carvalho, probably Danilo Pereira. It's the usual guys. It's going to be Ronaldo up top. But do you think we could may maybe just in a crazy galaxy see a difference? No. <laughs> I don't think so. I just, I don't think that he's the guy that's I tried. To... I tried at least. I know. I know. I'm sorry. I just... I... If I seem a little bit down on Portugal, it's simply because I don't trust Fernando Santos at this point. Um, I think that what he's been doing recently is sort of playing a 4-3-3 that it's it's basically a 4 or a 4-2-3-1 that masquerades as a 4-3-3 because he'll have Ruben Neves or someone else as sort of the base of that midfield, mm -hmm. but then he'll put William Carvalho as that 8, which will just sort of slide back into the double pivot at times. Now, I, I will say William Carvalho has actually been a lot better as far as his progression with the ball in the last couple of seasons with Real, uh, Betis, of course. Um, 
But I think that if I was to if I was to draw it up, what realistically Portugal will be playing is probably going to resemble a uh, a four two three one, um, on paper at least. But I mean, I wouldn't mind, and I don't think that this would be too far outside of the realm of Fernando Santos's comfort zone. I wouldn't mind sort of a a four four two diamond type of thing with maybe mm. either. Of course, this is me, Benfiquista, saying Florentino at the base of it just because he covers so well. Um, and then having Bruno behind Ronaldo and Rafael Leon sort of as the outside, inside forward, I should say. Um, but then that brings in so many other questions of can Ronaldo really play in a 4-4-2? Uh, because he's, especially with the players that we have that would excel in that sort of formation, like a João Felix or a Rafael Leon, because those three, Ronaldo, Rafael Leon, and João Felix, all like to drift to the left. Yeah. So then you have a problem of being in balance, etc. So yeah, I think it's going to be more of the same, man. I think it's going to be either the 4-2-3-1 or the 4-3-3 that becomes a 4231 pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> it shows up as a 433 on paper, but it becomes a 4231. That's just sounds like same old Santos ball to me. Mm-hmm. And it won't change. And it won't change. And I just feel sad for the Portuguese players and the Portuguese fans because they deserve better with the crop of players you guys have, honestly. But now I want to get to your 11 and then mm. Santos' 11. So, what is your 11 then for Portugal? I would say, okay, so my 11, I would have, starting from the back, Diogo Costa in goal because he's just been Facts. insane, insane, yep. insane, insane, good. Um, I think we're going to be looking at Ruben Dias and Danilo as the center backs. Probably Nuno Mendes at left back, although I wouldn't mind Mario Rui just based on how he's been with Napoli. He's been fantastic with Napoli this season. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah. It's been a complete a complete change. It's a similar thing to how all the Benfica players are in form, all the Napoli players are in form yeah. at the moment as well, and Spalletti. And then right back, of course, is Cancelo. Um, sorry, this is this is my 11, correct? Yes, yes, yes yours, we're starting your with mine. 11. <laughs> yes, okay. So I, just based on how dominant and how clean he has been in the midfield, I would love to see Florentino in there um, as sort of the base of our midfield. And I sort of have like a 4-4-2 diamond, so I'd have Bruno in front of him in central midfield. On the left, again, Benfica, João Mario. But the reason why I would put him there is because he has been playing when Benfica is in defense they drop into a 4-4-2 and Juan Mario does drop into that left midfield position and he tracks back on defense so I'd like to have him there Bernardo on the other side so on the right side of the midfield up front Ronaldo playing more centrally with Rafael Leon just off of him that's what I would like to see you know what's interesting is that a lot of people have started to point out that maybe Bruno and Ronaldo don't necessarily play that great together People have been starting to point that out, not just for Portugal, because Portugal is... I mean, Ronaldo, here's another one for you. Ronaldo has scored five goals in his last 10 games for Portugal, but those five goals came in two matches. So there's Against sort who, of, Luxembourg and Ireland, or who? I, yeah, I think it was, yeah. it was Luxembourg was one of them, and I can't remember the other one at the moment. Um, and so a lot of people have been pointing, do Bruno and Ronaldo really work together? Have they at United, really? Because we've seen when Ronaldo wasn't in the lineup. Bruno started to play really well at United, so there's people questioning that. Um, if I if I want to get really crazy, I would have Schwung Felix and Leung up there instead, Ooh. but but I don't think that that's ever <laughs> going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's <laughs> no. not going to happen, unfortunately. All right, now let's get to Santos' 11. Santos' 11. All right, so I think that is going to be that, uh, that 4-3-3 mm-hmm. sort of uh, f- shape, and I think that his back line is going to be the same. I think that... No matter who's picking it, it's going to be the same. Diogo Costa is going to be in goal. Mendes, Ruben Diaz, Danilo, Cancelo. That's going to be your back line. And then I think that recently he's been going with Neves of, uh, of Wolves. Um, and then maybe ahead of him, he would have Fitinha sort of as the eight. Bruno as the 10. Um, and then on the left, there's a big question mark over Jota. So I think that it might be Rafael Leon just based off of injuries and form. Um, on the right, Bernardo. And then through the middle, Ronaldo. Yep, I think that's Which, how, I think that I think that's what's going to happen at the World Cup. Yeah, and and when you look at that on paper, it's it's not a bad lineup, but it's oh, just no, whether that's a, top, that's a top five lineup at the World Cup. Yeah, it's a fantastic lineup. It's just a question of how the manager gets them to play and uh, if they're going to be on the front foot and if it's going to be Ronaldo Ball, where he has that magnetic. Everyone just thinks let's get it to him in the box and uh, let's try and <laughs> break beat down a door with a spoon type of thing. Well, funny you talk about him because that's the next talking point I want to talk about is Ronaldo. Obviously, I think this is going to be his last World Cup. And it, 
I don't want to be rude to Ronaldo fans, and you've gotten some heat from Ronaldo fans for your videos. He, he is at the decline, and he is arguably one of the greatest players of all time. Nobody will debate that. If you debate that, you're crazy. But you can just see, the guy just has lost a yard of pace. His touch isn't there anymore. His reading of the game is... It's, his overall game is so much slower that you're right. They're just going to feed it to him, and it's all down to Ronaldo. He's got to score because I don't think anybody else will want to create, and that's going to be Fernando Santos. Let's give the ball to Ronaldo. Let's create for him. And I think a perfect example was against Czech Republic in the Nations League. I think they must have put 10 crosses in the first half Portugal. All to Ronaldo. That's all they did. Cross, cross, cross. So what? what is what is it with now Ronaldo? What do you do? Obviously, you're going to have to play around him, basically. Yeah, yeah, you're going to have to play around him. And um, something that we've seen Eric Ten Hag try with him a little bit lately is having him sort of drop a little bit deeper and make use of his distribution because it's not bad. No. You know, he, he's really not a bad passer. At one time, that was his game when he was a young guy. It was It was more his passing and his crossing that was his top top of his game and then it became his finishing etc 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 so maybe that's what Portugal would try with Ronaldo dropping a little bit deeper and then Leon and Bernardo just a little bit higher sort of like you have Anthony and Rashford at Manchester United maybe that's the kind of shape that they go with um, because as far as like you said his speed is just not really there anymore so trying to play balls in behind for him to run on to we've seen far too many times with United this season that it just defenders are catching up to him way easier than they used to like you said his touch it gets away from him a little bit so he's basically becoming and he was already moving in this direction he's basically becoming the guy who just puts the final touch on a ball into the box but when that goes missing because he's only scored three goals from what is it let me see 16 appearances yeah three goals from 16 appearances this season when that finishing also goes missing Man, it's it's been tough to watch, hasn't it, Michael? It, it yeah. takes like four or five chances for him to just get it on target for one, and there's no guarantee he's going to finish it off either. So he's just a finisher at this point, and, and then, or dropping deep and distributing to the wings. Exactly, and also you saw the game against Spain. He had a couple of chances. He couldn't score, frustrated, and that kind of just I that sort of energy then feeds off to the rest of the team and to Santos. And then you saw when he didn't take those chances, sit back deep. Sit back deep. Whereas I think if Portugal continued to play in that game in the forward in the forward line, they would have won the game. But then you saw what happened. Morata scored in the last minute. So, <sighs> which, by the way, sorry to cut you off. Go ahead. Another game where Fernando Santos just needs a draw at home, <laughs> and he plays for the draw, and he gets burned in the last minute, just like against Serbia. So that's just Fernando Santos in a nutshell at the moment. It is. It is. So now let's talk about the group. Right on paper. Portugal should be winning this group. And that's coming from a neutral's perspective, even though I'm wearing the jersey. You have South Korea, you have Ghana, and you have Uruguay. You know why I call this group? I call it the revenge group. Because everybody has revenge on each other almost, in, in a way. Uh -huh. Because South Korea, of course, with Paulo Bento, former manager of Portugal, even though you know he did terrible at the 2014 World Cup. We don't need to discuss about that. And then you have, obviously, Uruguay against Portugal. Portugal needs revenge on Uruguay. So what's your kind of thoughts with this group? Should be easy on paper... But we saw, you know, 2016 Euros, that was a give me group for Portugal and they almost got knocked out. Yeah, I almost feel like Portugal does better when they're in a, uh, a more difficult group mm -hmm. at times. Um, look, I think the question mark over South Korea is Hyungman San. Because that, that's one player that can completely change. I mean, granted, they have very good players that are playing in Bundesliga, Spain, Premier League, etc. They have great, 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 great talent. Yeah, exactly. Kim Min Jae is in incredible. The, you know, the heir to Koulibaly has done very well. Um, so I or originally thought that they could be the team that would sort of cause some issues. Um, and I think that without Hyung Min Son, maybe they just sort of fall behind Ghana just a little bit. Because looking at Ghana's squad, I think they're a team that I definitely slept on prior to really, really investigating. I'm working on my World Cup content now. And prior to really, really looking into their squad and some of the players that they have, I think that they could cause some issues. You know, they're one of those teams where they weren't necessarily fancy during the qualification campaign. But now that they're in there... Now they have some other names that they can bring in, like an Inyaki Williams, to sort of make a difference. They could cause issues. It's a question of if they can all gel in time, if they've played it together enough, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that, and this might be the boring pick, but I think that naturally it's going to be Uruguay and Portugal fighting for one and two. Um, 
and I personally think that Uruguay is going to be the better team in some respects. I think that they they have a more coherent approach. Like they like to play sort of defensively, and they can hurt you in transition with guys like Darwin and etc. as well. But I think that they have a little bit more coherent approach to it, and I think that they're going to end up in first. And unfortunately for whoever gets second in this group, it's they're probably playing Brazil. You know, so yep. it's basically when I was speaking to a to another podcast mate of mine, we were calling the Group H sort of like you're either first or last because if you get Brazil in the next round, good luck to you, exactly. whether you're Uruguay or Portugal. So if I was to pick sort of the order, I would say Uruguay, Portugal, Ghana, South Korea for this one. But think about this as well. If you do finish mm-hmm. first in the group and then whoever finishes second in Port- Brazil's group, you could possibly play Serbia again. Yes. Oh, God. <laughs> Either Serbia or Switzerland, and everyone knows that Switzerland are a headache to play against. They're Very so, so annoying. And Serbia, incredibly talented. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, Serbia again, man. So it can't shake these your, guys. what is your expectations? Are you thinking, all right, we know the manager might negate this team a little bit, but I'm expecting quarterfinals at least. What's your expectations? I would say if everything went well, that Portugal could get to the quarterfinals. Um, But I don't think that everything's going to go well. And I think that they'll end up playing Brazil in the round of 16. And then it will be night-night for Portugal, unfortunately, um, in that first knockout round, basically. That's that's sort of how I see things going, at least at this moment. Should be enthralling. And I wish the best for Portugal. I love the country. I love the players. I hate the manager. That's all I'm going to (laughs) say. That's all I can say. I hate the manager. It's just... Imagine this team with like a Ruben Amorim, a Conceição, or somebody like that. Oh, Anyone. I would I would pick. The good thing for Portugal is you win this group, you're on the easier path. And then you have an easy path to the final. But I don't think they're going to win this group. I think Uruguay will win it. That's my expectation. So let's see what happens, Adrian. Best of luck. Thank you. Thank you. And if anything, there's always Canada, right? Thank you all for watching. And of course, a big, big thank you to Adrian for joining me on the preview. An absolutely marvelous guest. The guy knows his football. And that's why he has a gazillion subscribers. So if you haven't done so already, go subscribe to Adrian's channel, Rabona TV. And remember, we're going to have another couple of previews of certain nations. And I will be uploading those in the next couple of days. So stay tuned for that. And of course, World Cup coverage throughout the tournament here on the channel. Hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel if you're new around here. Remember to give your thoughts in the comment section down below. Have a beautiful day. Stay safe in this crazy world. And adios.